Chapter two is about recognizing your traits. Chapter one explained that the trait approach is one of the earliest approaches to understanding leadership, and I would argue also communication. The approach remains relevant now. In chapter six, we'll return to a variant of this when we think about strengths-based approaches to leadership and communication. As you listen to this lecture, focus on these three topics. First, the trait approach focus, what makes it different? Uh, second, the strengths and weaknesses, quick hint, one and two right there are in the lecture, but not in the book. And number three, the six key traits of successful leaders. The book goes into a ton of detail with examples. I will not repeat all of that. The book actually goes through a number of different important leadership traits when it first opens. Quote, diligence, trustworthiness, dependability, articulateness, sociability, open-mindedness, intelligence, confidence, self-assurance, conscientiousness. There are, so, unquote right there, but there are so many more. Uh, so let's talk about the history of this. Trade approach emerged in the early 20th century. It was one of the first systematic approaches to study leadership. Besides, uh, you know, Julius Caesar, think of somebody else who's demonstrated leadership before 1900. Now think about what you remember about Abraham Lincoln. You likely, unless you dove into, let's say, Peter's Inn or something, you went to a school that taught about somebody like Lincoln or somebody like George Washington using a great man style theory. Those theories, they focus on finding these innate qualities or in characteristics of great leaders. Do you remember being taught both were really tall guys? <laughs> That's something I actually remember. Uh, the original trait leadership believed that great leaders were born with certain qualities that differentiated these good leaders. They looked at physical and psychological features to see which ones were associated with leaders. So who was tall? How old were they? How smart were they? And you're kind of probably guess that with the focus on things like height and age, does it sound like we're headed down a really dangerous path towards racism and sexism and at least a bias against people who aren't at least six foot tall? Yeah. So let's even look at the descriptors in our book. Um, in chapter two, George Washington was described as tall. Did y'all even catch this? <laughs> it like stuck out to me so bad. Um, but chapter two, they talked about George Washington being tall. They didn't describe Bill Gates physically. LeBron James, I mean, obviously physically powerful was how he was described. Who can argue with that? Mother Teresa was being described as small. And then it talked about Oprah Winfrey's weight, which really stuck for me because yes, she did Weight Watchers. She also has her own TV network and has done so many other things. Why does it matter, does it? Well, people used to think so. And then in 1948, this scholar here um, really challenged that approach and asserted there wasn't a consistent set of traits between leaders and non-leaders. As you know, you can be tall or you probably know somebody who was really tall who was not a leader at all. Like that's not any kind of predictor. And it tends to really privilege certain types of people based on things like gender or even um, race. So they started analyzing a bunch of different trait studies in the 1940s and found there wasn't a clear agreement on which traits mattered and all of them together made the list way too long to be useful. And maybe you've seen somebody who's pretty confident as a server in a restaurant. That doesn't mean that confidence will carry over if you make that person a kitchen supervisor. Uh, and I'm gonna keep coming back to that example since I know some of you work in restaurants. So I wanna make three big points here. One, quoting um, two communication scholars, or Johnson and Hackman, you probably hear me refer to Johnson and Hackman again. Uh, quote, personality traits alone do not adequately explain leadership, unquote. Like with the restaurant kitchen, the situation there matters. The author of our book points out that we now have, quote, reconceptualized leadership as a relationship between people in social situations, not a quality, unquote. So let's go back to that um, kitchen manager example. You can be extroverted and maybe even have a lot of knowledge about how the restaurant kitchen works, but personal factors are at work here. Let's say you were an assistant manager and promoted to manager, but the other assistant managers, they've never liked you since you fake called out for COVID uh, four times last year. Uh, you could have traits like confidence, charisma, determination, but yeah, that team is not going to see you as a leader, not based on just certain traits. The situation and the behavior patterns all really matter there, your choices and your relationships. Now there's still trait research going on. Um, so I do have that on the slide there and I wanna point that out but it primarily looks at how traits impact performance and the perceptions of effectiveness. 
And research use that a lot of times they'll look at strengths in leadership. So if you remember Strengths Finder, it falls into that category. Uh, and you may have been taught this as well, but Strengths Finder is sometimes used by corporations even to form teams. It does have a little bit of a purpose there, but it's not going to determine ultimate success as a leader. In some ways, it also maybe works a little better just for predicting team behavior. So how does this approach work? Um, and does it. <laughs> so first off, the trade approach is very different from other approaches because it focuses exclusively on the leader, not the followers or the situation. The leader focus makes the approach more straightforward than the other approaches we'll talk about. Um, you'll catch me saying probably repeatedly for chapter three, this is complicated because it is. Trait is simple. Um, it gives these really clear categories. And second, it emphasizes effective leadership as hinging on a leader having a certain set of traits. Uh, this suggests that organizations can be more effective if a manager or leader fits a trait profile. Uh, so third, trait approach can also be used for personal awareness and development. And if you remember taking Strengths Finder, sometimes it's kind of cool to be told you're good at a certain thing, or maybe you lacked another area, and you can think about in hiring how this might look. So let's say you're at an accounting firm, you are looking for a new accounting manager based off of what happened with the last person. You know you want somebody who is decisive, confident, intelligent, and social. All right, so those are the things you're looking for. You've got your trait list off of a leadership book. <laughs> so you interview with this candidate and you find he's confident, he's social, offer him the job, and can you guess what just went wrong? Well, I didn't mention anything about actual ability to be an accounting manager. So sometimes we can get so focused on these traits that are good traits, we miss the fact that, yeah, they need to be able to run an accounting team. So before we go into those criticisms, let's look at the strengths of the traits approach. First, you'll want to think about how it fits with popular conceptualization of leaders as special people. Second, it does have a century of research to back it up. I mean, it does have some credibility. And in third there, you'll see it focuses um, or sort of conceptually highlights the leader component in the leadership process. I mean, that does matter. Uh, leadership involves leaders, followers, and situations. Of course, the situation for our classes, we'll be looking at communication a lot. The focus on leaders allows us to have a deeper understanding of how the leader and the traits relate to the leadership process. Um, just warning here, that can lead to a weakness. And then on the positive side, it does make for the hiring process to go kind of smooth like we talked about for the last slide. Um, it can provide benchmarks for what we're looking for in a leader. Um, if you know the lack of sociability or lack of confidence is an issue for the way a team functions and you're bringing in or hiring a leader for that team, that gives you somewhere or something to look at. Uh, when you're doing an annual review, you can point out a trait focus that somebody else can improve upon. And perhaps maybe you've been told to be more confident. In fact, the book says being confident is an important trait. Okay, so let me do a little flashback here. Remember the Amy Cuddy body language power posing, the super popular TED talk, might have seen it in the high school or in a speech class. Um, well, you know, stand up straight, hold your hands like this, you'll seem confident is what it said. Research turned out not to be very strong on that. Um, but that idea took off. People loved it. Why? Well, it's easier than actually focusing on changing long-term behaviors, how your relationships work with other people. And if you start to think, well, confidence is standing up straight and all I need to do is go into my meeting and sit up straight, well, <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going to work out for you. Um, that's not going to carry across, let's say a presentation example, you're giving a presentation at work, you go in, you use your power posing because your boss said you need to be more confident. Yes, that is a good trait criticism, a good trait to focus on, but just thinking, standing up straight and looking confident in a meeting is going to change people's perceptions of you. Well, you can see how that's that weakness where you're focusing in just on what the leader is doing, but in a really shallow and effective way. All right, so let me talk about it. <laughs> I'm already talking about it, but let me talk about the criticisms in more detail. Um, there's no definitive list of leadership traits. I've mentioned confidence, but as you got to a little bit in chapter one, a lot of this is really cultural or even regional uh, or depends on other factors, like what's a leadership trait in one organization or team might not carry over. Uh, second, this doesn't really consider the importance of situations. Uh, so remember that quote from Sajil earlier in the lecture, you've got to be connected with your followers. 
And I'm not going to name this person, but I'm going to take a moment and talk about somebody I knew who was quite famous for trading shenanigans in the 1980s. Uh, he later, when I met him, he was the CEO of a manufacturing company. He had like key, what I would call leadership traits, decisive, determined, charismatic, confident. I mean, he was one of those leaders who walks into a room and it's like, aha, the leader is here. Could not communicate at all. I mean, writing emails, terrible. Um, normal phone calls, awkward. Um, it really helped, hurt him with connecting with followers and also with working with people um, outside of just in-person conversations. How do you get to be this major CEO if you couldn't write an email? Well, first off, he, in the 1980s, you didn't have to worry about that uh, so much, but he had this reputation for being intense and difficult. In the 1980s, that worked. Uh, in the 2000s, expectations of employees, of followers, of other organizations, and therefore his situation had changed. Um, for him, and this is again what makes him a great leader, he adapted and he hired somebody to write all of his emails for him uh, in order to connect with the followers. So it's not this trait, um, let's say with the communication skills that made him great. And it's not his positive leadership traits that made him great. It was his focus on how he could connect with people and take an honest approach to solving his weaknesses. I feel like if you can remember that story, it'll probably really help you um, when we get to test questions about weaknesses of the approach. Uh, let me look at a few more approaches here um, and a few more points. First, people with a set of traits might excel as in one situation, but not in the other. Um, kind of like that leader was awesome in the 80s, harder in the 2000s. Uh, second, some people might have traits that help them become leaders, but not the traits that help them stay leaders. So you might think of somebody who's really aggressive or really... Mm, somebody came to mind, I don't want to talk about them. All right, somebody who would really push for a promotion and go for it, ask for it, demand it, but they don't have those further leadership traits. Their leadership trait maybe of this aggressiveness got them further, but it's not going to help them when it comes time to communicating with the support staff. That's not, that pers not what that person's good at. Um, unless they work at it. Um, so third situation can influence leadership. I keep saying this, but I just want to you know, really emphasize how important this is. Um, it's tricky to identify a universal set of leadership traits uh, because um, trait and approach, it, it gets this really highly subjective list of the most important leadership traits. Um, subjective because it doesn't look at followers or situations. So we'll have one author, one scholar. If you get in the popular self-help books, you'll see so many. Um, they'll say X trait is important and another one says Y trait is important. Um, trait research emphasizes identifying traits, but it doesn't often look at how traits impact group members and their work. You're not much of a leader if you don't have a group or anybody following you. Uh, when you did Strengths Finders, um, here's another example. Did you look at your results or did you think about how your strengths might impact other people? I've had some students who get to part two where they think about the impact of their strengths on other people, but usually what happens is you get that report, you see it said my strength was this, my strength was not that, and you're like, oh cool, I should do this. Um, you don't think about other people with it. That's one of the weaknesses there we'll come back to. Uh, so trait research looks at the link between traits and leadership emergence. It doesn't look at the link, I, I love that, so let me just say it one more time. Trait research looks at the length between traits and leadership emergence. So some of you absolutely have traits that will help you with leadership emergence, but they're not going to sustain you once you get into that role and you're thinking about how do I communicate with people who work for me. Uh, it also doesn't look at the length between traits and other outcomes. So for example, productivity and employee satisfaction. So all that said, bottom line, Trade approaches got some really cool features. It's not that useful for training and development for leadership long term. Traits are not easily changed. So even if we had a definitive list, I mean, how do we teach some of, go back to the old school stuff. Uh, these, how do you teach that? Uh, traits are largely fixed psychological structures that, that really limits the value of teaching, of training, of improving those advanced communication skills. So think again of the book's descriptions of um, Mother Teresa and LeBron James. Um, Mother Teresa was not going to play for the Lakers. It doesn't matter how hard she trained. You can't teach height. <laughs> uh, so we absolutely know as well that doesn't matter. Uh, it might make a first impression impact, and there is research on that, but it's not going to impact how people actually see you on a day-to-day -day basis as a leader. 
So do traits matter? Did my critique convince you they did not? Uh, I'm not trying to go one way or the other here. This is where it's great to look at your self-assessment for chapter one again. I'm betting you got a non-zero number for traits. I got a non-zero number. Um, it wasn't my top one. It was one of my lower ones, but it was on there. Um, trait approach can be valuable. It's just you need to focus on what matters and is backed by the research, which I'm going to really emphasize this semester. You'll want to use this traits-based approach as looking not for a definitive set of traits, but a direction about which traits are good for people who want to be leaders. Uh, so the next slide will be about intelligence. Um, that helps a lot. Trait assessments allow people to see if they can have certain traits and pinpoint strengths and weaknesses related to leadership. Um, that could be useful as you seek to explore how you can maximize your own abilities or like that CEO mentioned earlier, you need to hire someone to send your emails because you see that you're falling down on the relational aspects and your communication skills are just, it's not your thing. All right, so that said, leadership trait studies, um, that Stodchill one from 48 and then there's another one, 74, um, in particular found that an individual isn't a leader because they have a set of traits. The traits have to be relevant to the situation the leaders are in. Leaders in one situation may not be leaders in another. That's why I use the example of someone being a bad kitchen manager. Managing the wait staff takes different skills than managing um, back of house or say full front of house. Um, some traits like confidence might carry over, but it's not going to make that person the right leader for that situation. Um, all right, I'm going to just be completely transparent. Uh, so I have actually been criticized for being too confident sometimes. Uh, it is, I think, something that I've just been my entire life where if I understand my values, I understand my goals, and I know what I'm doing and have a real vision for where I'm going, I will be really confident about that. And what I've had to realize is although my confidence can inspire people who are following me, it can also make people a little bit nervous. Um, so the more than I know what I need to adjust here for my trait is that I have to be sure that I'm explaining all of the research behind my decisions and my justification that gets, I'm not talking about my team who works here at UT Dallas, but that sometimes can create more buy-in because otherwise my confidence level can come off as, well, why? <laughs> why is she like that? Um, but really I'm confident because I know I did the work. I know I have a vision for where we're going um, and I did the research. All right, so next, uh, one more point here um, and we'll move on to the top six key traits. Um, this is important. Leadership is not passive. If you just got that example, that took active work, it took self-analysis, it led to more me thinking about my behavior and my group interaction, and it was not, and then how I communicate with those people. Uh, that comes from working with group members, and findings like this about leadership not being passive has led to additional behavioral and situational leadership research. Uh, so your book talks about how studies have identified traits. We're going to go through some of those in a minute, um, because the six key traits in the book now that I've gone through all this, there's not these key lists, but there are six ones where they've used advanced statistical techniques, looking at all the studies to look for the traits that appear consistently. So I am going to talk a little about those. Um, so six key traits are intelligence, confidence, charisma, determination, sociability, and integrity. So those are the top six in the book. Book covers them super well, so I'm going to try not to repeat anything in the book. Um, so first up is intelligence. This is not the good test taker necessarily. It means you have good language skills, good perceptual skills, good reasoning ability. It means you're well informed. It's one of the reasons I recommend subscribing to business newsletters and podcasts. Um, but let me think, or let me all of us think a little more rash, relationally about this. <laughs> a manager might notice from an employee's email that an employee's grumpy. So here we have this communication moment, a moment of analysis. A leader here is going to use intelligence and say, ooh, well, maybe this employee is angry because we've reorganized this, because they had a change in their schedule, something else happened. In fact, North House, um, not in our book, but in another study, points out that leaders tend to have higher intelligence than non-leaders, and they just get things like that because they're incorporating a lot of different information um, and have emotional intelligence there too. So here's something though that I'm just gonna complicate it for you a bit. Um, leadership can be counterproductive if the leader and follower IQs are drastically different. So there was a study in 2017, Simonton, if you wanna Google it, uh, but they found that the optional IQ is above one standard deviation, let me say it again, just above one standard deviation above the mean follower IQ. 
So here is my example to help you get this because um, we're coming off of a break. Uh, but think about those stereotypical Hollywood Hallmark movies. You can think of those. We're at least seeing the jokes about them online. All right, so big city top firm lawyer moves home to take over the family apple orchard. It just sounds like a plot, right? The big city lawyer can't speak the language of the employees. Um, so there's these communication difficulties because big city lawyer might be bringing in all this advanced corporate training. And the employees are like, well, we, we need good equipment so we can do our jobs and be safe. Uh, so it's a really classic example. It's become, you know, a cliche really with these movies of how a leader with this higher IQ or more intelligence than the followers is going to maybe have trouble communicating ideas. Uh, my, what I would counter here is that if you were truly intelligent, you would also be intelligent with communicating. So I would love to redo that study and consider communication as a key aspect of intelligence. But there's me. Um, so let me give one other example from the workplace that's not a Hallmark movie. Uh, let's think about you have a small medical billing group. Um, you're hired June. June just finished here at UT Dallas. She did her BSMS fast track. Um, she's awesome. Um, she interned a few years ago and was always super smart, but now she's finished her master's and she's, you're bringing her in full time. Staff is good, hardworking, great relational team. Uh, they're not really college educated because it's medical billing and they didn't need that. A lot of them will have medical billing certificates though. Um, they are not the type that would think, oh, let me go get my master's. That's going to be loads of fun. <laughs> so some people just love that stuff. Um, so June, we have high IQ June. She comes in. She's using all these big words that she's been using because hey, she's been in grad school. And she tries to communicate, but it's not going well because although she's high IQ, she doesn't have that communication intelligence. Um, so it doesn't take long for the employees to figure out that she's kind of stuck on the fact she knows she's smart and she's hard to talk to. Uh, that's not going to be a solid way to build team relationships. There's a clear skills and communication fix, but the trait, just straight intelligence can be a problem if you aren't applying that intelligence to focus on how people perceive you, your relationships, how you communicate, and so on. Uh, there's this curvilinear relationship between IQ and perceived leadership. So it's good to be smart as a leader, but if you're too smart, it can impact leadership perceptions negatively. And again, perception is the key word there. It doesn't mean it's going to be hard to be a leader if you're smart. It's just that you need to apply that smarts to communicating in relationships too. All right, next up, confidence. You ready to do your power posing like I mentioned earlier? So sit up straight, push back your shoulders. Uh, do that to stretch, but that's not what's going on here. Uh, confidence connects to self-assurance, so you know you can reach your goals. Move forward. Keep going. This is something you can build. You have to be aware of what's required, and it helps to have a good mentor. This is huge. Um, find a good mentor when you get to a workplace. Most people who I know in leadership, they didn't jump into that in their 20s or 30s. These are people who lead because they thought they could make a difference, help out a team, make things better, maybe going back to junior high. Uh, so uh, pause for a second on mentoring too. If you are applying to jobs, that is a great thing to ask for. I know that part of the reason I'm successful is I have had people at UT Dallas and also before I was at UT Dallas take time to offer me some mentoring. Um, even this week I got a, a call from somebody about how to um, improve my ability to manage a couple of people in a meeting. And, and that's a gift like it's some people might take it as like wow they're critiquing me it wasn't a critique it was a gift because now i know how to work better with those two people when i'm leading meetings uh, so some places will have mentoring programs they'll help you connect with a mentor that can make and break a career let me give you a quote that i actually really like from chester hubert about this he was the ceo of onstar um, he says quote great leaders have the ability to act decisively and with confidence to inspire their team while simultaneously displaying a humility that respects and encourages their team's best efforts. There are great leaders that view successful outcomes as both achieving specific objectives and improving their organization's ability to deal with the next wave of challenges, unquote. I love that. Uh, so think about what he says with acting with confidence but displaying humility. That's how you encourage a team. Let's go back to the kitchen manager. Um, brand new kitchen manager. What if that person comes in confident in their ability to lead They've never worked that kitchen before, but they are prepared to trust the existing staff because they know those staff put in a great effort and the new manager is aware, super aware of how much they have to learn about day-to-day -day processes and operations. 
Now we're getting to somebody who maybe is out of their normal domain, but could actually succeed. All right, this is not common. Um, this is something with charisma where it makes for an amazing CEO, but also unfortunately a fantastic cult leader. Uh, charismatic leaders tend to be good communicators, persuasive, inspirational. Uh, when I think of really good communication and charismatic leaders, I mean, who did not have Martin Luther King Jr. in a speech class, right? Um, it's just like a great leader in a corporation. He, and this sounds like a really corporate way to put it, but he aspire, inspired people, all different people, to high levels of performance. On the flip side of that, destructive leaders, this is the dark side, they can use their ability to speak well, establish a vision, or have a lot of energy to get their goals, which might be personal goals or vendettas. I have seen this in the workplace too. Recent Harvard Business Review um, study that I read was talking about how as charisma increases too high, effectiveness begins to decrease because charismatic leaders can think they're really effective, but it's just charisma <laughs> and it's not going to take you maybe as far as um, some people, well, not going to take you, I don't want to say you, but it's, it is so rare. It's not going to take some people as far as they think it will. I've seen this in team projects and team presentations at, on campus and in the workplace too, where somebody's really charismatic. So they come into a team presentation, they want to take the lead, they have all this energy, but then the presentation falls apart because this person was resting on the idea that their charisma was going to carry them through the presentation without actually working with the team or thinking about the content or the meaning of what they were presenting. Consider this point made by the authors of that Harvard Business Review study, quote, self-confidence, for instance, may turn into overconfidence and narcissism in highly charismatic leaders, while risk tolerance and persuasiveness may start to translate into manipulative behavior. Further, the enthusiastic and entertaining nature of charisma may turn into attention-seeking behaviors that distract the organization from its mission. And extreme creativity can make highly charismatic leaders think and act in fanciful or even eccentric ways, unquote. I have seen this. It's rare, but just trust me, there are people out there who are charismatic, but the charisma needs to be balanced with other qualities like intelligence and respectfulness and we'll say this next one, which is determination. All right, so we're on our last three here. Determination, there are scholars that actually think this is the one trait that matters. Uh, so there's an economist who works at Harvard Business School, really famous, um, Rebecca Henderson. And she says, really bluntly, good leaders are focused, like that's it. Um, somebody who values determination might say a good leader keeps going when everyone else gives up, if you've heard that before. Um, however, in my opinion, a good leader also knows when to cliche here, but throw in the towel. So go back to that CEO who wrote really bad emails. Hire somebody to make up for your deficiencies. Find a way to work with your team so that if you know you are not the charismatic presentation lead off, somebody else takes that role. And if you're too determined and too focused on task, too goal oriented, you're going to run that risk of neglecting relationships or seeing failures as just failures and not growth opportunities. All right, so last two traits here. Sociability is referring to a leader's capacity to establish pleasant social relationships. So an example would be a coworker or a manager who puts people at ease. Also walking around the office, getting to know people, remembers names, listens, feels like, hey, I could go talk to this person. Uh, the social interaction is going to help to build relationships and set people at ease. So let me flip this a little to an example of how some people attempt this. If you've done an internship, you've probably played what I call the card game at work, is when somebody has a baby or gets sick, so one person buys a card from you know the grocery store, everybody signs it. And frankly, those drove me a little bit crazy when I was in a workplace that did it. Why? Well, it's an attempt at demonstrating sociable relationships without doing some of the actual work of sociability where you're really getting to know someone. I know I signed cards in that workplace that did them for people I didn't know. That's not a social relationship. That's not going to improve the workplace dynamic or communication. It's just going to be a sign off. And I'm not saying don't do them. I think they can be a really nice token and a gesture. But if you want to be a sociable leader, it needs to go beyond that. Um, in fact, think about, if you're trying to think of who is, what is this sociable person, if you work from somebody who thinks that a lunch out as a team is a good reward or a Zoom happy hour will improve morale, probably a manager who really emphasizes sociability, a leader who's sociable. A determined task-oriented manager is probably never scheduling a Zoom happy hour. 
Um, so again, I'm not trying to critique the card stuff, but a truly sociable leader is going to go beyond that. And a, a leader who is sociable and intelligent might know that their team doesn't want a Zoom happy hour too. All right, last slide before I wrap up. Integrity as a trait is so interesting because we have all these examples of huge corporate scandals during the past 20 years. <laughs> oh, beyond that. I mean, but especially in the past 20 years now that we have um, more transparency and court cases. So a good example would be Elizabeth Holmes. Um, she was the CEO of Theranos, sociable, charismatic, cool, kind of fun corporate look, <laughs> intelligent, determined, dropped out of Stanford, raised capital, courted and wowed investors and media for her company that was going to be testing blood. So places like Walgreens bought in, it was huge. And then it turns out she, like integrity zero. <laughs> so the testing systems didn't work. She used traditional testing systems to fake results for her um, testing system that didn't work. Employees felt really bullied by her. She lied. She pressured other people to lie to investors and into federal investigators. Um, she texted things that is kind of it's funny, funny to me now, but I'm sure it wasn't funny to the investors. Um, text messages where they she even admitted disaster. And after they had these federal cases and state level court, court cases too brought against her, um, she opted to stay on as CEO. So you can kind of guess where it goes. The company ends up being shut down and liquidated. It's a, that's an extreme example. Um, but if you lack integrity, it's going to be a problem. Um, if not now, it'll be later. And that's an extreme example. Let's talk with um, something more typical. Um, and in fact, <laughs> I'm paused here because I'm like, I'm going to tell you an example um, from somebody I um, know really well. And, and they had an employee this past couple weeks where the employee has called in and said, hey, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to get tested for COVID. They go get tested for COVID. It's negative, and But they've already missed that day. And it keeps happening. Uh, and so we're going to guess where this is going. It, if you are using this, let's say you actually do get sick, then all of a sudden it's a question. You can't just say, hey, I'm going to go to the doctor and necessarily be counted out. <laughs> and that can be a problem. Um, another example might be, this is I could see happening too, um, you work with this guy who's an assistant manager, supposed to send an end of week appointment report by email, 4 p.m., right? Um, so you have to, it's your job to sit there and make sure those reports come in at four on Friday. So Joe regularly sends that email with no file attached, or he sends a corrupted file. And you guess where this is going. Joe's not tricky. You maybe know people who tried this in college too. It's buying time so he can leave early on Friday. And if you can't trust Joe on this, on this silly little thing, and if Joe could just be transparent and communicate with you about what's happening. How do you trust them on other things? So as a leader, you might step in and meet with Joe, fix the situation, but we already have a problem there that's going to damage that relationship long-term. That felt like a really negative note to end on. So <laughs> later in the semester, I'm going to go more into ethics and communication. Uh, the short summary for this chapter comes back to these three questions. Um, this. In this lecture, I did go a little away from some of the textbook content, so be sure to catch the answers to one and two uh, as I went through it. On the last one, the book is offering more detail about the six traits and more examples that might be useful for you as you study. And you're also figuring out, like I said earlier, uh, leadership is about to get, leadership and especially leadership communication is about to get a little complicated. Um, understanding though how other people view leadership, so if you know the person you work for, thinks leadership is a trait, that can then help you as you apply your intelligence, uh, as you communicate with them and work with them long term. All right, everybody, we'll follow up with chapter three.